normal, having put on events like this myself, I understand how much work, uh, how much dedication they take. Uh, so thank you very much for all of your hard work. And especially thank you for giving me voice, having spent much of my career in the shadows and in the darkness, uh, and, and as a result not being able to speak my mind, it's a great time to be able to do that. At the last normal conference, I delivered a talk called Flip the Switch, and I'd just like to briefly summarize the Flip the Switch theory for you. Uh, it's based on my reading of public opinion polls, which very consistently show that about 70 to 80 percent of Americans nationwide support medical cannabis, but that only 40 to 50 percent of them support full legalization. Those are kind of strange numbers, right? Because what they mean is about 25 to 30 percent of Americans are simultaneously saying that they support medical cannabis, but they're opposed to the legal sale of cannabis. And so we have to ask ourselves, since these folks are a margin of victory, uh, what those reservations stem from. And in my experience at Harborside Health Center, with many, many patients and citizens groups talking to reporters and elected officials, I've become convinced that those fears stem mostly from concerns about what a legal distribution system would look like. Any idea that these folks can endure in their mind of what the legal sale of cannabis looks like scares them and scares them very much. So I advocated and flipped the switch that our movement should concentrate on building on the existing support for medical cannabis. That we should promote regulations that will enable positive models of cannabis distribution. And then use those positive models of cannabis distribution to reassure the fears of our swing voters and win them over to full access. The, uh, M74 measure on the ballot in Oregon this election is an excellent example of the kind of tactics that I was advocating in Flip the Switch. Well done, Oregon. My support for Flip the Switch is based on my belief that cannabis should be part of a larger paradigm shift in healthcare in this country. It's based on my understanding of how and why people actually use cannabis the way most people use cannabis. It's based on an understanding of the difference between wellness and intoxication. And my belief that almost everybody who uses cannabis on a regular basis is using it to enhance their wellness rather than to produce intoxication. If it was only about getting high, would the hundreds of people at this conference and the thousands of people around the world who have dedicated their lives to fighting for cannabis liberation have done so? I don't think so. I think the reason for our dedication at bottom is that we all know that this plant really enhances the wellness of our lives and of the people around us. So there's, there's a lot of, 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 of my dearest compatriots People like Russ who say, hey, I love cannabis, but I'm not sick. I'm not a patient. And in fact, I'm offended when you call me a patient. I would respectfully say to my friends that I think that you are locked in an attitude of traditional concept of Western medicine, a concept that says either we are sick or we are healthy, that says that we're kind of like a car, right? That we're either running or we're broke. And if we're broke, all medicine needs to do is fix us up and get us running again. The problem with this is that the entire thrust of almost all medical research over the course of the last few decades has shown that the mechanical approach is far too simplistic. That instead of sick versus healthy, human beings actually operate on a graduated spectrum of wellness. And that such tools as diet, exercise, and daily habits are at least as valuable and probably more valuable than interventionist tools like pills and surgery. <laughs> Taking uh, these thoughts to the logical conclusion, you don't need to be sick to use medical cannabis. <laughs> Rather, cannabis can be one component in a lifestyle of wellness that also includes exercise, good organic food and vitamins, massage, reiki, yoga, and all of the other low-impact holistic healing techniques. 
My view is based on my personal experience at Harborside where we have over 60,000 registered patients. It's also based on all of the recent science that we've been hearing about, all this cannabis science, this exciting things like the discovery of the endocannabinoid system and, and our discovery of the profound impact that it has on the working of the human brain and so many different processes in our body. These amazing discoveries that we've been hearing about, about the preventive and curative properties of cannabis, as well as the palliative properties. So in summary, I believe that cannabis is used most often to enhance wellness, not to produce intoxication, and that it needs to be looked at in the overall context of the healthcare debate in this country. As legal distribution of cannabis expands, and I believe it will continue to expand, the debate about how it's going to be sold is going to intensify. Does it belong in the bars and the liquor stores with the vodka and the rum and the gin? Or in the pharmacies with the Adderall and the morphine? Or at the 7-Elevens with the cigarettes and the beer? Or does it belong in holistic healing centers that surround cannabis with other low-risk healing holistic products and services? That's what I think. There's another question, another question that informs my view of the future of medical cannabis. And that is, how should our industry, our new developing industry, relate to the world of mainstream commerce? How should our businesses relate to all the other businesses that are out there? And those of you who are familiar with my work at Harborside know that one of the things I've emphasized over and over again is that we must be professional, that we must bring professionalism to the cannabis industry. But I'll tell you today that if that's all we do, it will not be anywhere near enough. If all we do is bring the business world's professionalism into the cannabis industry, then 20 years from now, cannabis is going to be like every other mass-produced, plastic wrap, big box commodity in this country. And I don't think that's what most of us are struggling for. Certainly, it's not what I would count as being a victory. I think we have to incorporate the lessons that this plant teaches us into our approach. This plant teaches us very valuable and precious lessons. I think that's why we value it so deeply. Lessons about kindness, lessons about compassion, lessons about generosity, lessons about responsibility. So my vision for the future of cannabis is built on these two principles I've been talking about. One, that cannabis should be used to enhance wellness and is used to enhance wellness. And two, that whatever distribution system it is that we build must reflect these precious lessons that the plant teaches us. So my vision, my vision for the future of medical cannabis is a nationwide or worldwide network of locally owned locally controlled, non-profit, community service dispensaries with full selections of the highest grade laboratory tested medicine that return benefits to patients and communities, that dispel the stigmas associated with cannabis, that gains the trust of our fellow citizens and convinces the 25 or 30 percent of swing voters that we need to win over to embrace full, unfettered access to this most precious of medicines for all Americans. Thanks very much. Um, just for the record, um, even though I was one of those who questioned the wisdom of putting Prop 19 on the ballot in California, I have repeatedly and continue to call for everybody who supports cannabis to support Prop 19. As long as there is one prisoner in one jail cell anywhere in this world, none of us can ever afford to quibble over the details. None of us can ever walk into a voting booth and pull a lever against the legalization of cannabis. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Steve. Our final presenter, uh, 
certainly doesn't need two introductions, but uh, since I did it once already, I will uh, stick with the format. Uh, she is the executive director of Americans for Safe Access, and as I said, an award winner at the uh, Normal Activist Awards this year, uh, Steph Scheer. Hello, everyone. Well, this is a great conversation. I'm glad you're all having it. Um, I want to let you know that I am a patient and I am a criminal in most settings in my life. Um, actually, I live in Washington, D.C., uh, where we're in a regulatory process and I continue to remain a criminal. Um, and uh, while I, I am, I'm really excited to hear that you all are having this debate as legalizers, I just um, want to put something into context and, and just let you guys know that I am not a political strategy and neither are the people that we represent, that legalizers did not make marijuana medicine. All right, the truth is that this has been a medicine for thousands of years, and we are affected by the same laws. But let me be clear that there is a population of us that you've invited, right? In your dialogue about marijuana as a medicine, the truth is there, there are millions of us out here in America that are patients. I did not come to this movement from the legalization movement. I have really enjoyed working with Winnie, many of you, uh, and we have a lot of enemies in common. But the truth is, we are gonna disagree uh, in a lot of arenas as we move forward. The criminal justice system is one aspect um, of, of my life as a patient, and for patients across the country. It's one aspect, and it's one where we have a lot of commonality in, in how we're treated in, 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 in this country. Right? So when, when it comes to patients being arrested, uh, people going to jail, we do have a lot in common. But there are a lot of other fights that we're fighting as patients that, that have nothing to do with, with the criminal justice system. They have to do with access. They have to do with finding a space within modern medicine to get our medicine tested and accepted. We're fighting for our children, for custody of our children. We're fighting for our homes. We're fighting to keep our jobs. Uh, and uh, the context of a healthcare system. So let me just say a question that gets asked to me a lot, and I, and I, I want you all to know that this is, a, this is a hard conversation. I'm very, very honored that you're having it here and having it in this format. Um, but people often ask me, you know, if, if, if marijuana is legalized, doesn't that just solve all of your problems as patients? And it doesn't. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the other struggles that patients and the medical cannabis uh, patients are, are, are dealing with that are, that are outside of the arena of what we're talking about here. So something that we've talked about today is that actually through the uh, recreational use of cannabis, uh, aspects of the plant have almost been wiped out. CBDs uh, have almost been wiped out. And, and that is because this, this plant has been bred uh, in the recreational landscape. I don't think that if you legalize marijuana um, that, that there will be a specific focus for patients and the medical aspects of this plant without a focus on medical marijuana. It is a, uh, a separate issue. Uh, it's the same plant, but, the, but it's a separate issue of how patients want to see this medication integrated into a medical system. Uh, I don't, uh, just for the record, I don't want you to go to jail. <laughs> I don't want any of you to go to jail. But that is, but that is not the work. That's not the work that many of us do day to day. Uh, m m most of the work that we're working on in medical cannabis is sitting within departments of public health, bringing, trying to find space within uh, American medicine to actually talk about this discovery of the endocannabinoid system. Right? We're not talking to cops. We're talking to doctors. We're talking to bureaucrats. That's a lot of the work we do, and it is a very different arena. Um, there's a whole, whole you know, a range of reasons um, that I want you to know that we are fighting alongside, but there will be different things that we work on. And I don't, uh, I don't want you to all take, take the fact that, that, that not every patient is a recreational user or supporter. Personally, we're a very large population, and I think that we, that the patient population reflects an accurate, uh, sample of all of America. So I agree that, that, that we are not your Trojan horse. I mean, I've, I've enjoyed some of these descriptions. I think I've been called 
fertilizer, a stepping stone, pavement. So I'm actually not any of those things. Um, 